Well, good evening. Good to be with you on this Wednesday night. I'm glad we can open God's Word together. Uh, I want to take some time tonight and go back. At a, it's really a topic, a subject that uh, I've taught on. We've talked about here this a uh, couple, maybe two or three times throughout the, the few years that I've been here. I want to kind of cycle or circle back to it tonight for a few minutes. And really, we're going to focus on one word. And that word is providence. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And, and as, I, as I do that, I'm going to read some scripture and I'm going to read some other things, but we'll kind of walk through some of this together. Uh, the first thing I want to read for you, though, as we get started, is from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And for, for many of you, this is a verse that you know, that you recite, that you love, that you cling to. And amen, and may it always be so. This is truth that we need. But I want to understand it within what we're talking about tonight. Romans 8 says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So things work together for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. And then he continues there in 29 and following in verse 30 says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. People talk about that as the, the golden chain of theology there. And um, some, some meaningful, meaningful verses. And you've probably heard those verses, may hopefully love those verses that we read. And those verses speak volumes about the word that I'm using tonight. And that word is providence. And, and I'm not using the word providence, or we're not. Um, as though this word is just important in and of itself, but that word we can use to describe something bigger that we see going on here in Scripture. We talk about God and His nature, who He is as a being, and we say He is triune, He is Trinity, right? The word Trinity itself isn't used in the Scriptures. And so uh, we use this word Trinity to describe God. That word isn't in the Scriptures, but we fully believe that what that word means and refers to is a biblical concept, that God is three in one, that he is this one divine being, one essence in three persons. And, and so we say this is biblical truth, uh, and we take this big, vast concept or truth about God, and we refer to it using one word, Trinity. Well, again, that word's not in Scripture, but the concept of Trinity, the teaching of Trinity is in Scripture. And, and really, with the word providence, we're doing something similar. We're not going to read the scriptures and see the word providence, um, but we are going to read the scriptures and, and see within the scriptures clearly that God is a God of providence. And we see this at work um, all throughout and, and really the big picture teaching about scripture. Now, um, providence is a word that was used a lot more in days gone by. You go back to early in the, our nation and, and go back into some of those religious leaders and even outside of religion, civil leaders, that kind of thing, you can see the word providence in reference to God. We don't probably use it as much, but um, the Second London Baptist Confession, or the London Baptist Confession, um, talks about providence in this way. And it's wordy, but I want to go ahead and read it and kind of jump off from there. It says, God, the good creator of all things, and the infinite power and wisdom doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, to the end for which they were created, according unto his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. Lots of words there. Let me go back to the first part of that. God's the good creator of all things, and in his infinite power and wisdom, notice what he does, according to the, the confession that's here. He doth uphold, uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things, from the greatest to the least. So what we are talking about here um, is the providence is a reference to God, who he is and what he does. And what we are talking about is really the invisible hand of God guiding things toward his desired end that the God that created this world is moving this world and all that is within it toward his desired ends and purposes okay and so we 
again, it's in his invisible hand. And it's not just talking about uh, specifically only the things that happen to believers in that sense. It's, it's the God who is God over it all is ultimately moving things where he wants it to go. And so this is a belief that's very much tied to this core teaching about who God is, that God's sovereign, that he is, he is free from external rule and control, that he is all-powerful, that he is almighty. And we're going to talk about this, and uh, for we use words like providence or sovereignty and, and some of those things, it may give us thoughts or questions or ideas. We may be opening the door to some things that we haven't thought about, but my encouragement to you today is to, is to think about it, to to consider the scriptures, but let the, let the scriptures, as God's spirit leads us, guide us to understand who he is, how he moves, what he accomplishes. Um, we're not going to look at one verse, one thing that says, oh, this is the doctrine in a nutshell. But I just want to point out in, in some kind of broad strokes, big picture, that God is a God of providence. Do you remember the story of Joseph? Turn to Genesis 49 if you want to turn there. 48, 49, 50, all, all throughout there. Um, I'll kind of recap a few of the things before we read a little piece of it. But, but do you remember the story of Joseph? He was the favorite of his father, Jacob. Uh, he, he was the son born to him in his old age. He was given the coat of many colors. He has these two dreams, one of the sheaves of wheat bowing down and one of the stars, the sun and the moon bowing, and, and all of this representing his family one day bowing down before him. And as you know, they didn't take to that whole thing too well as he reveals it to them. He eventually gets thrown in a pit by his brothers, and they were going to kill him, but they don't, but they sell him into slavery. Uh, he ends up in Potiphar's house, and he has, he has success, and he does well, and God blesses him in many ways. But then Potiphar's wife makes advances to which he does not pursue. He actually rejects and goes the other way, and she tells a story, ends him up in jail. And even as he ends up in jail, God's, God's hand is still on him. And what a, what a crazy thing for us to think about, that even as he goes to jail, he finds himself in a difficult situation, incarcerated, Yet still, God is blessing and having favor on him as you go throughout the story. And I know I'm hitting the high points, but he ends up being successful. He's trusted by the jailer. Um, he tells dreams to the baker and the cupbearer, and he's right. But he ends up being forgotten there for a period of time until Pharaoh needs help. The Pharaoh, the leader of all of Egypt, he has these dreams that are troubling him and his wise men. Nobody can figure it out. And at this point, Joseph gets remembered. And they call on Joseph, and Joseph tells him the meaning of the dreams, and there's going to be some successful years, and there's going to be famine to follow, and so you need to prepare, Pharaoh. You need to get things in, in line and so that you will be prepared for this famine that's upcoming. And so what ends up happening is Pharaoh puts Joseph in that position, the second in command over all Egypt, and Joseph's job is to take care of it. And so here he is now, a powerful leader in Egypt, and his family his brothers who had sold him into slavery and essentially left him for dead, they told their father that he was dead. Now his brothers come, they're experiencing famine in the land, and they are coming looking for help. And so there's this story here, and here's Joseph, and they're all bowed down before him is what's going to happen. And so we, we see that picture and what takes place, all the turns. <laughs> what an interesting life. You think you've been mistreated. Now, you think you've had some things go bad. Read the story of Joseph, and it might make you feel a little better about what's going on uh, with yourself today. So, so all of these things happen, and, and I'm really giving you the short version, but they end up reconciling, the family does, and they come down and, and live in Egypt, and, and things are good. Well, Jacob, Joseph's father, eventually dies. And we get to where we pick up here. I want to read Genesis 49, beginning with verse 15. He says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, is Joseph, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we caused him. So they sent the message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brothers' transgression and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when the message came to him then his brothers also came to him bowed down before him and said we are your slaves 
But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result. The survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. They're scared that now that Joseph's father, they're all their father, is out of the way. Joseph is going to be vengeful and he's going to return evil for evil. Now, I just I think this, this story and really those words of Joseph there, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, speak a whole lot to this whole idea of providence. And, uh, and again, I want to just review today a few points here um, that we see really observations about providence that are just based on this text of Scripture. Let me just point them out to you, four of them. Uh, one, God is sovereign not only as creator, but also as sustainer of his creation. Joseph doesn't say the words, but he clearly believes that God is fully God, that God is at work and that God is accomplishing his purposes. Um, the reason God can do this and Joseph can trust him is because God is sovereign. He's not bound by anyone or anything. He's not restricted by anyone outside of himself. He not only creates the world in which we live, but he, he continues to be actively involved in it, ruling and sustaining it. You think about Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You get into John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that's been made. And so you have these, these statements that go together. So He is Creator. We see that clearly in the text of Scripture. But He is also ruler and sustainer over His creation. Colossians chapter 1 says, everything was created by him so there's creator in heaven and on earth the visible the invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and then notice this last line and by him all things hold together god did not create the world put it all together and then just let it go and have nothing to do with it God created a world that he is bringing to his desired end at his desired time, and he is moving things in that direction. He creates, and he, is, he gives life, and he sustains life. Hebrews 1, chapter 3 says that he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. God is actively involved in the world in which we live. It is true in so many ways that we don't even think about. Just in the natural world that we would have breath to breathe because God is at work. He sustains the universe. Not only that, but, but God can and God does work in through and around the decisions of men to accomplish His purposes. Now that's a big, that, that number two there is a big one. But God can and does work in, through, or around the decisions of men to accomplish his purposes. Isaiah 46, verse 10 and 11 says, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of a, my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth and in the seas and in all the deeps. God's plan will be accomplished. Is that a comfort for you today? God's plan will be accomplished. Joseph acknowledges this. His brothers had made sinful choices. They had chosen to do wrong, but those choices did not hinder the plan of God. And what a mind-blowing thing it is to think about that not only did it not hinder, that would work as a part of God's plan, a part of, a part of God's redemptive purposes to bring about the good of many, many people. God uses good decisions, faithful decisions, and God uses bad decisions. God can work in amazing ways that are contrary to the normal order of creation. God delivered his people from Egypt by drying up a seabed. God spoke through a donkey in Balaam's situation. What a great thing for us to be reminded of here today. And whatever your situation you're in, whatever you're going through in your situation of life, 
The world may seem like it's caving in at times. And things may legitimately not be good around us. But be reminded, God is on His throne. And, then, and no one, no evil, no thing is going to stop the ultimate purposes of God. What a comfort that can be to each and every one of us. So, God's in control. God is working things toward His desired end. and He will use the decisions of all kinds of people to do that. Which kind of ties with the next point. The number three here is the same t- at the same time, Scripture makes it clear that men make and are responsible for their own choices. I'm going to put these things together. God is sovereign and He's in control and His providential hand is bringing about His purposes. And we see even in the same passage, though it doesn't try and explain it all, these men made decisions. Joseph's brothers did evil, like real evil. They chose to do what was wrong. They did what their wicked hearts wanted to do, and they're responsible for the evil thing that they chose. We're not given any indication to the contrary. Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil. He knows they're responsible for what they did, and they own that action. to stop the hand of God at work. But men make real decisions. And we're responsible for those. And we're going to be judged by that. Revelation 22 says, Look, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to repay each person according to what he has done. Listen, we, we can talk about this and we can have a discussion and we can have a Bible study and we can talk philosophically about some of these issues for a long, long, long time. So God's good. God's in control. He's sovereign over all things, yet bad things happen, yet people do evil, yet how is God in control, yet still men are responsible for their decisions, and how do all these things work together? And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot there that we don't know in our finite minds. But what we do see scripturally is that ultimately God is bringing things to his desired ends. His purposes will be accomplished. No one is going to stop that. And at the same time, we see clearly that we make decisions and we will own those decisions. We reject the Lord Jesus Christ. We reject the salvation that's offered us. We are going to uh, face the consequences of that decision. We don't have to get everything because we're not going to. But we can hold up these truths and go, yeah, God is who the Scriptures say He is. And I'm responsible for what I do. And so is that next person. We don't have to sort out all the details all the time. I know that can be troubling uh, to some of us. but uh, And and we will grow in knowledge as we move forward in our walk with the Lord and, and wisdom. But let's affirm the things that we see the Scriptures teaching. The last kind of observation I would make is that providence shines brightly on the people of God. Well, what does that mean? Let's just talk about it for a minute. Providence referring to God's work in the world. Believers, unbelievers, animate, inanimate, inanimate. God's hand is guiding things toward His desired end. But for us, as God's children, we should find this an especially wonderful and gracious and precious truth. Jacob, or Joseph rather, had walked through difficulty. He had walked through evil And he was able to see that God's hand was on him through these things that had taken place. That God had been moving and accomplishing his purposes. Now, what all Joseph understands as he walks through it, we don't know the details of that. But we do know that when he gets to this situation that we read earlier, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That God was saving a whole group of people through those very things. God had put Jacob or Joseph right where he needed to be for a people to be spared, for a line to continue. A line from which Messiah comes. The truth of who God is should change our perspective like we see here with Joseph. You notice the way he's able to deal with his brothers graciously because he is entrusting himself to a faithful God. 
as believers, you and I can and should be able to deal with things differently, handle them differently, the hard things, the really hard things. Yes, there's things that may be evil, but we can trust our good God. We can trust the sovereign hand of God in the circumstances that we find ourselves. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and following says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me able to see the grace of god and to trust in his sovereign hand and i'll go back to romans chapter 8 28 we know that all things work together for the good to those who love god and are called according to his purpose listen we can talk in vague generalities about everything happens for a reason and and god has a plan and all that and and i'm not saying that there's not truth there but what i'm saying is there is, it is different for a child of God. The redemptive quality in the evil that you would face is there because you are a child of God who is going to work good in your life. And I don't mean work easy or work always the way we want, but I mean there will be, as we follow faithfully with Him, He will draw us closer to Him. He will be exalted in us. The next verse, I'll go again. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So will he be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Doesn't that remind you of Hebrews chapter 12? Well, Jesus is the author and finisher, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Revelation, he is the alpha and he is the omega he is the beginning and he is the end god is a god of providence his divine hand is at work and if he has called you out as his child and if you are his there's a confidence that you can have because of that very fact not in you but in god that's why paul says right i'm confident in this very thing that he who began the good work in you will carry it to completion this is what we talk about with providence this whole big broad idea and all of this for the glory of god joseph understands he was in the position for the survival of many people and at that point we don't even know even then what level of understanding he had he may have understood that that for his lineage for his father and his uh, brothers and for his family line right there he's thinking we were able to survive and, and that would be absolutely true but there's a brother that he has whose name is judah uh, judah who was not a great guy but from in the line of judah there is this one who would come genesis 49 10 makes really clear that the scepter is going to be in this line and it refers to the messiah that Jesus comes from this line. And so uh, Joseph says that this was for the survival of many people. Absolutely, God's hand was at work to, to bring this people out and to tell this story and for all of these things to happen. And from this line, Messiah would come. And nothing was going to stop it. You can go all through scriptures and you can see God's hand at work in Abraham, in Moses, in Esther. Think about what happens with Jesus. And as, as Judas Iscariot is, is accountable and responsible for the decisions that he would make to betray the Lord and Savior, as all of those people are, yet at the same time, they are bringing about God's salvation. That the Messiah would suffer and die for our behalf. And that he would be raised to life. My encouragement uh, tonight is uh, just a few things here. We can, as we think about this truth about God and His providence, we can thank Him for the consistency and order of the universe that He upholds, that the sun rises and that it sets, that the tides come in and out and all of these kinds of things. We can praise God that He isn't somehow bound by the decisions of men. 
This is why Paul can express confidence in God. What about you? Uh, I hope tonight that your hope is in God and in God alone. Love the people around you. Find your hope in God. Care for, pray for, uh, be about the good of your people and of your country, but have your hope in God and in God alone. In the circumstances that you face today, find your hope in God. Rest in Him. Cast it all on Him. Have confidence and trust the fact that God can and He will accomplish something in you and in the circumstances of your life as you trust Him. As you consider that God is sovereign and He is His providential hand as it work, find peace and find rest in your soul in turbulent times. Because though it can seem like chaos around us at times, God's on His throne. And He is who He is and it doesn't change. And I would point us ultimately, and I've referred to this several times in some ways already, as we think about God's hand at work and God accomplishing His purposes, I would point us ultimately to Christ. Well, we can think about Christ as the example to willingly humbling Himself and submitting to the will of the Father and, and, and trusting in God over the circumstances around Him. We can, we can go there, but I'll, I'll specifically tonight, We see, as we think about the story of salvation, we see God's providence at work all through it. From You go back to Joseph, you can go back to Genesis 49 that we referred to, you can go back even earlier than that. You can look at the story with Judas, you can work all through that and you can see how God is at work. Men are making decisions, some trying to honor the Lord, some in absolute rebellion against God, and it doesn't accomplish, it doesn't stop God from accomplishing His purposes. Have you trusted Christ? to save your soul? Have you turned from your sin and asked Christ to save your very soul? Know the grace that we talk about tonight. So thankful for the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you this evening. Father, thank you uh, for your truth. Thank you, God, for your hand in our lives. I pray tonight for this congregation that you would Strengthen us, sustain us, Lord, in every way that you would see fit. May you, God, receive glory and honor and praise. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you again. Remind you, we've, we've posted on Facebook as well, but let me just remind you again, we're going to have one service throughout the rest of July here at 1015 uh, here in the Family Life Center. And so that'll be everybody all together. We're Got it nice and spaced out, and so come on and be a part of that if you're comfortable doing that. If not, still live streaming at 10:15 uh, for the three weeks in July. We're going to have Sunday school in the evening. I know that's different for a lot of you, and then some of you are had that Sunday morning routine, but this allows us to space out more, and so we we decided just to do this for July. So five o'clock on uh, this Sunday, and then the two following, we'll be meeting for Sunday school during that time. So. Uh, you can check with your teacher if you need to do that. If your teacher in class isn't coming for some reason, um, we can find a class to put you in and you can join us for Bible study. We'd love to have you here for that. But every, um, we're not rotating classes like we did the last time. All three weeks we plan on having the classes meeting. So we'd love to have you here and to jump in and be a part of that. Hey, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Check in on your church family. Uh, we love you. We are thankful for you joining with us. Hope you have a great rest of the week. Man, we look forward to seeing you again on Sunday. We'll talk to you later. Bye.